Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fans of the Premier and Space Museum. Our Zoom interview to, for today is Mr. Del Lowry. Hello, Mr. Del Lowry. How are you, sir? I'm fine, sir. How are you? Great. Uh, Mr. Lowry is a the the author of the Boneyard Almanac, uh, picture book about the uh, Boneyard that I have in my hand, which you can't really see. But um, uh, it's, a, it's a great book, guys. Pick it up. Um, and we also have a special guest, Mr. John Taylor. John, Hudson, say hi to everybody. Good afternoon. All right. And John it was instrumental in helping uh, Dell actually uh, doing some of his uh, book work as far as uh, the some of the early pictures of the of the Boneyard and things of that nature. I'll let you guys uh, elaborate more on that later. Um, OK, I'm going to get started here with with Dell. Um, Dell, I have a one. The first question I have for you is, how did you get started in aviation? Well, uh, growing up, uh, you know, when I was just a squirt still living with my mom and my dad, I was uh, doing so on strategic air command uh, bases. My dad was in SAC uh, all of my uh, childhood, with the exception of the last few months. Um, so uh, we're talking Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, F.E. Warren in Wyoming, off it twice in, in Omaha, various other bases throughout uh, the world. And uh, you can't live on an Air Force base with the exception of Effie Warren, who has no, no runway, uh, without spending your time with your nose poked towards the sky, watching you know, whatever happens to be shooting touch and goes at the time. So that was B-52s and KC-135s constantly doing that. It was, it was an air show every day. Uh, my dad was a flyer. He was a, uh, an EC-135 crew member. And then he ultimately went over to the, uh, the E-4, uh, which was called NECAP at the time, the National Emergency Airborne Command Post. So... I was constantly exposed to it. Um, and then once I joined the Navy, uh, too many years ago to, to really say out loud, uh, I went and got my, uh, my private pilot's license at uh, Brownfield near San Diego because I was stationed there at the time and uh, flew for many years. And then my, my, my submarine seagoing uh, duties got so busy that I couldn't fly enough to stay current and stay safe. So I dropped it. And while I'm still a licensed pilot, I just don't fly anymore. I mean, Avgas is ridiculously expensive and gone are the days when you can just walk, walk out onto a municipal airport without passing through 13 levels of security. Um, again, in my day, you could walk out there and wander up to a person who's working on their Cessna 172 to strike up a conversation. That was the great thing about aviation at the time uh, is that you were all like-minded folks with a, with a passion for flying. You, you end up spending, you know, 30 minutes, you know, asking them about their, you know, their, their pride and joy. Right. All right. Our, uh, yeah, I, I, I love aviation myself. I, I, I grew up in it. My dad was a helicopter pilot for a long time. And and uh, and like I said, it just it just grew on me. My uncle was a, a DC-6 pilot who got killed. Uh, he had a mountain with a bunch of uh, uh, inmates from a Colombian prison. Uh, and that's how I got into it. I just it's in the blood. You know, I understand completely. Uh, John, same question to you. Um, I just seem to have a natural interest in it. There's nobody in my family that was in aviation. My dad was uh, <clears throat> one of the early Seabees in World War II. But uh, I was sitting one night and a black and white ad came on from the Civil Air Patrol and I just suddenly told my, my parents, I want to do that. Uh, <laughs> and so I started out uh, in the 50s in the Civil Air Patrol and went from there and joined the Air Force out of high school. Uh, and just, you know, I've got a, I've been cleaning out a bunch of old pictures that I took, like Dale said, when I was in high school, I could just go to the airport and walk around and take pictures of something. And they were all, looking back, they're all terrible. <laughs> you know, nobody should take a picture of an airplane from 50 yards away. Right, <laughs> it took exactly. A long time to take, learn how to <laughs> take a picture where you could tell what it was. Uh, but just went on from there. Uh, and when I wound up in Arizona, <coughs> uh, best, one of the most fortunate things is I met Ben Knowles Jr. Uh, and Ben took me by the hand and uh, started getting me onto Air Force bases and said, this is how you take an airplane picture. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And, and educated me. And then he got me swapping slides with a gentleman in Japan named Masumi Wada. 
Uh, and that was like trading portraits with Michelangelo. Huh. Guys take the most fantastic photographs I've got. They're just, it's, it's in-flight photographs. You can read bureau numbers on A3s. Uh, so it's like I'd send him 20 slides and he'd send 19 of them back. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, th thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, I mean, and, and he was right. It just didn't meet the standard of what, what he was doing. Uh, so it educated me. Uh, and uh, then there's a whole long story. I could waste an, an hour talking about how I got involved in the museum and how I got from Jacksonville, Florida to Tucson, Arizona. So I'm not going to waste your time on that. John, you're, you're in Tucson, right? No, I'm in Brunswick, Georgia. Oh, okay. I thought you were said you were in Tucson. South bottom southeast corner of Georgia. Mm -hmm. hmm, I used to live in Georgia. Okay. Yep. So all right, Dell, there's just questions for you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your books. Well, <clears throat> I, I've been taking pictures for a, a great many years. Uh, kind of like John, I, I took pictures in my youth and, and they were all from extraordinary distances. And you might be doing well if you could you get the outline of what you were shooting. I got some great pictures of Ellsworth Air Force Base shooting through the perimeter fence. And again, in the, in the mid seventies, you know, the security folks, the air police wouldn't even bat an eye if you're, if you're shooting a picture of a B-52 sitting on the ramp. These days, it's a different story, <coughs> Excuse me. but they're all from a very large uh, distance. And I had a tiny little lens. So, you know, you can imagine what the pictures are like. Uh, but then when I joined the Navy, I uh, volunteered to become part of the Periscope photography team. So the first decent picture I ever took was on 70 millimeter th uh, film through a periscope sticking up, you know, 15 or 20 feet above the submarine. Um, and at the time, it was all actual imagery. It was, it was plus X film, 70 millimeter size. We would process it in uh, what was called the wardroom pantry, which is where the officer's food was prepared. So those poor guys had to deal with some interruptions in their, uh, in their meals when we were processing pictures afterwards. <laughs> oh. uh, but just a basic and larger, and we'd print whatever we, uh, whatever we captured for the captain. And every time the captain would press the button on the periscope, he'd rip off 10 pictures. So you could hear it go, ta -ta 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 -ta. and what was different about every picture is that the, uh, the, the camera settings would change for every one. So every button you'd get <clears throat> a, a variation in exposure and, and uh, depth of field. And one of those 10 was always a good picture. And that's why the, the system worked that way at the time. So mm -hmm. we'd print that one and, and as many as he wanted and send them up to his, uh, his stateroom. And ultimately that would become part of our, uh, our uh, uh, post deployment report to higher authority when we got back to port. Uh, but yeah, that's how I ended up with, uh, you know, with the camera and photography bug. And that just, of course, there was a natural connection between that learned ability and my interest in, in aviation. Hey, very cool. Very cool. That's uh, of course that led up to your uh, uh, your current books that you have and whatnot. Right. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, if you guys don't don't know, this is one of the best books to. to yeah, I can't. You get most of you can't see it. Blocks it out, but there it is. It's the uh, Boneyard Almanac, 20th century 20th century picture book by Mr. Del Lowry. Uh, if you want to, you want to throw up your your link there. You can also, uh, Del, if you like. That way you yeah, can just 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 head over to dell-lowry.com and the, the last name is is easy to remember you just spell the word laugh l-a-u-g-h and then add e-r-y <laughs> so it's dell-lowry.com and and the first uh link in the the menu across the top is boneyard almanac and uh there are hundreds and hundreds of pictures that i've posted there there are examples from each of the four boneyard almanac books um i mean uh, these days, you're not going to get rich, uh, you know, printing books anymore, just because there's so much digital stuff out there. Uh, but quite honestly, uh, I I developed or authored the first one just to see if I could do it, because there's challenges relative to dealing with, you know, the the the, the physical size of a page and trying to get all the words around the picture that you're trying to describe and not try it and, and not have it translate to a different page, which many times I fail to do. Oftentimes, I would translate to a different page. Uh, but then there's there's quality of the picture considerations. So when you're working in Photoshop, there's the density of the dots and there's this, the size of the picture and so on. So it was very challenging. Um, and also going back to that time frame when the first book was uh, published, um, the folks at AMARG, uh, now AMARG, uh, or yeah, the other way around, the folks at AMARG, now AMARG, um, were, were uh, allowed to just 
uh, through their through their local public affairs folks um, allow you to come aboard and, and take pictures. So I would work with the PAO. She would let me aboard. First couple of times, she was very close to me. Second, third, fourth, fifth time, she would say, "Okay, I'm going to be. I'm going to start at the at the top of this row. You walk that way, and when you get about halfway down the row, I'll reposition myself. Excuse me, myself to the far side of the row." So what I'm telling you is I pretty much had free run of the place. And, and, and once you developed a reputation with these guys, you know, they, they would put a little trust in you. So I would walk an entire row of KC-135s, for instance, and, and not see her, except she was just this distant dot sitting in her, her, her Air Force white van. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the book thing was just a, really a, just a desire to share the pictures that I had acquired over those many visits. Um, it was it was never never a desire to get rich because again uh, printed material unless you're unless you're printing something like uh, the Hogwarts stories uh, you're you're not going to see a lot of cash from this kind of thing. You know, it kind of kind of amazes me. I see uh, online uh, Boneyard Safari, for example, they are they're getting uh, all kinds of photos from the, the Boneyard, and I'm, sure. I'm like I'm like wow, it's probably the same sim something similar. They built a rapport with the with the Boneyard, or they know somebody in. The boneyard that'll let that'll says, "Hey, come on in. We'll show you this." You know. Yeah. So, but well, I tell you, I tell yeah. you what, boneyard safari uh, guys, if you haven't seen boneyard safari, they got some really neat stuff on on their website. Um, I believe it's boneyardsafari.com if I'm not mistaken. Um, but like I said, the whole the whole point is it's it's about you know preserving the history of these aircraft. I mean, we we don't. There's a lot of aircraft out there. I just uh, we just had another B-1 bomber uh, go to the boneyard a couple of days ago, and I was at work and I saw it fly over. I'm like, oh wow, okay, there goes another one. So I'll tell, in total, there's about five, five or six that are in there in the boneyard right now. So uh, there's more to come. Uh, and the reason that they're doing this is because of the B-21. The B-21 is going to be prototyped uh, flying by next year. So they're trying to retire. You know some of the stuff uh, currently. So, all right. Next question, gentlemen, is for both of you. Um, I think I'll get Dell first. Uh, Dell, uh, what? What? Um, actually, it's going to be a two-part question. I should say. Um, what intrigues you and what interests you guys about the boneyard? Oh well, gosh, that's easy. So the first time I went, it was with my father. He was a, uh, again, he was an Air Force flyer. And there was an EC-135 in the boneyard that uh, he had flown when attached to the, to the 4th Axe, the Airborne Command and Control uh, Squadron. And I believe the 4th was at uh, Ellsworth, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, they were having a reunion of the, uh, the uh, Airborne Command and Control Association because, uh, you know, those squadrons have all been disbanded as of the early 90s. So you have some aging folks who want to kind of remember what they were doing. And the AMARC folks were kind enough to allow uh, the folks that were attending the reunion to come aboard. So I, of course, I arrived with my camera and, and I'm not kidding, they, they, they'll take you out on the bus and the moment you walk off the bus and you're sitting in front of this airplane that's been there for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, I, I, I believe in, in my heart, you can walk up to this airplane and touch it and kind of feel through your hands all the thing it did in its lifetime. You know, every one of those tail numbers up and down that row and then further out as you go into different kinds of aircraft, you, you can just feel it, tell a story. I did this. This was my role in protecting the country. You know, I may have not, I may not have gotten shot at, and I may not have shot uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or fired in anger, but every one of these aircraft had a mission, and it was serviced by technicians that kept it flying and piloted by people who were willing to go in harm's way. And, and here they are at, at the end of their lives. They're waiting either to be recalled or, or destroyed, because those are effectively the... You know, the two options with the exception of a few that get parted out or sent to museums or perhaps some a and p schools and it's there's just this feeling that comes over me it, it really is almost overwhelming that's just that's a good perspective honestly I, I i couldn't have said it better myself because it's the same same thing when you're out there when i went on the tour of the boneyard myself uh, you look at these aircraft and i was i went to the boneyard when they were showing the b2 when they had the b2 uh, um um they had the tooling for the b2 yeah and uh i they let us get off the bus and i was looking says but you can't take pictures of it i'm like oh man you know so it, 
you're right. It's all about, you know, looking at the history that you see the veterans yourself, John, you know, everybody who was a, as a veteran that actually flew on these aircraft or maintained these machines. I mean, they're complex machines. I mean, they have a history and a story to tell. All right, John, your turn. Um, when I first moved to Tucson and stumbled across Cove Road, and it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, because I'd grown up reading all the uh, everything I could get my hands on, and it's like all these airplanes are sitting here, and that was '68. Um, it wasn't till about '74 or so that I met Ben Dolls. Ben was retired Air Force Master Sergeant. Uh, had been a, a KC boom operator on uh, KB-50s and... Uh, uh, KC-97s? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have... Like, uh, like this thing behind me. <laughs> yes. Every now and then my, my brain departs left recently. Don't worry. Someday I'll tell you that the conversation I've had with my doctor and it's very unsympathetic. <laughs> it happens. Uh, anyway, uh, and and Ben had the knack for getting on a, on, you know, and getting into into then Mazdaq and getting turned loose, and uh, uh, kind of like Dell. Uh, Sometimes we would, Ben would get us in with, with a traveling group and most people were, you know, I want to get a picture of every airplane and, and collect every tail number. And I was, you know, like, I want to get front, back, left, right, every side of this airplane because, you know, it, it is and, and I want all of it. Uh, so I was always the guy who was lagging behind and, and everybody's, you know, 20 airplanes down the row, and I'm still trying to get the best angle on an airplane. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, how do I get the whole airplane in and, and get the tail number and, and get the squadron patch and, and get the, the light where you, you know. <laughs> so I was the guy who was always holding the group up. <laughs> uh, but that was just, I think, probably the classic time period. Uh, because the Air Force and the Navy was upgrading and so much stuff was, was coming in out of Southeast Asia. Uh, ben would get us on on a Saturday morning once or twice a month uh, with permission to just go on and go to the receiving area. Hmm. And you just no telling what was showing up. It's kind of like today. One of the pictures I uh, sent Dell, there's a an F-100 that's got all kind of strange kill markings on the right nose. It's like, what's this? Never have figured out what the story behind that airplane is, but. <laughs> I think it's on page 117 of his book, John. There's, there's got to be a story there. That airplane came out of the air guard with, what is all of that? <laughs> yeah, that picture's on page 117 of his book, I think. I think that's the one right there. But, you know, you look at that and you know, there. There's a story and a history and, you know, some guy sitting in a no club somewhere <laughs> bragging about something. No doubt. Yeah. And the no story doubt. is larger every time he tells it. No yeah. doubt. <laughs> okay. This next uh, question um, is mainly for Dell, but John, you can chime in on this question too, if you want to. I mean, it's up to you. Um, now, I believe I, I was talking to you about this before the, the interview started. Um, what Dell? What's your what's your background in aviation? Or right now, I mean, what uh, are you? What do you currently do with aviation? So uh, since two thousand and four, I've been with Pratt and Whitney. So I retired from the Navy in two thousand, and uh, my background, of course, from from a submarine perspective, was nuclear power generation and maintenance. Uh, but while I was doing that, I was also heavily involved in uh, in the training world. Uh, so I got my degree in workforce education while I was in. And then once I got out, I got another, uh, I got a master's in education through uh, Embry-Riddle. Uh, anyway, so I, I have for all this time been involved in various uh, uh, training roles within Pratt & Whitney. I spent some time as a curriculum developer uh, with, their, uh, with their, their customer training center. Then I uh, uh, started, uh, um, uh, excuse me, I started uh, 
uh, leading the, the military training program until uh, January of this year. Uh, and then I moved over into the uh, Joint Strike Fighter Engine program, specific again to training. <clears throat> uh, and you and I were talking about this earlier, Dan, the, the Joint Strike Fighter program is different than every other legacy program in that, of course, first of all, it's gonna be many, many thousands of engines, um, but there, there's an extra organization relative to the OEM, Pratt Whitney, talking to our customers, and that is the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office. So everything we do, say, any data we send or receive generally goes through them in one, to one degree or another. Um, so I've been given a, a specific role to deal with F-135 training, both for the employees, uh, as well as uh, any training that flows out to what's called the, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter uh, Training Program. And that is a, uh, a series of what we call initial qualification training offerings at the training center at Eglin Air Force Base. So we wrote the curriculum. I maintain a staff of 12 instructors down there. Uh, and then for employees, uh, we just need to get our folks smart such that uh, you know when the Air Force or the Marines or the Navy call, uh, or any of our other uh, uh, foreign operators, we have an answer when they when they when they need it. Awesome, awesome, yeah. John. John, do you want to chime in on that one? It's uh, up to you. I'm overwhelmed. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, nowhere near that. Yeah, yeah. While I was in Tucson, I got my private pilot's license, uh, and other than that, I've just always been an air enthusiast. Uh, mm -hmm. I just finished dragging five boxes of magazines out of the attic that have got to find a new home somewhere. Oh boy. But mm. I've, I've started, you know, it's like reading, I opened a Air Classic 69 edition the other day. Some of these things have got articles on airplanes or in the museum. It's like, oh, okay, somebody's got to take this. Uh, so. Shoot, send them to me, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if you have thousands of them, I don't know if my, my apartment will have to be fit them, so. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I always wanted to wind up working in aviation, and the museum is just as close as I got, and life circumstances just kept pinging me off in different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, like I said, I got my first air show. I'll, I'll answer this question, too, because my first air show was at Schenectady County Airport in New York, okay? And I watched the Blue Angels with the A4 Skyhawks, okay? My second air show really really got me hooked, but unfortunately, there was an accident at that air show, and I, I was witness to it. And um, yeah, there, were, there was two A A4s from the Blue Angels that cut each other's, um, cut each other's wing and took out the cockpit, killed one of the pilots and uh, the other aircraft just spun out in front of the crowd. And I'm like, oh my goodness. But that's my second air show. And ever since then, I've been hooked. You know, I've been an aviation enthusiast too. You know, that's why I got involved with the Premier Air Museum. The Premier Air Museum was uh, kind of like my Disneyland, I, as I call it. I call it Disneyland. And um, I was there when the... I first saw the Premier Museum when the SR-71 was out underneath the tarp, underneath the oh shelter. Yep. That was a year or two ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my father and I, we came down here for an air show, and we stopped at the Premier Museum after the air show, which leads me to um, make an announcement here, guys. Uh, there is going to be a meetup, a meet and greet at the air show on November 6th and 7th here in Tucson. Uh, I did post it on our uh, Facebook page. So I'm pretty sure, John, I, I, I think you said something about coming coming down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to, to meet you in person. Yeah. Um, the details haven't been really hammered out yet. I kind of want to do uh, after the air, an air show type of maybe dinner or, or a pub or something like that. So, well, okay. I'll just uh, throw this at you because... I've reached that, that age where I can't walk an air show ramp all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, bought into the, the big tent and the reserve seats for Sunday. Smart man. Oh, really? Oh, really? So Deborah, Deborah and I are going to go to the show on Sunday. 
So that's well, our I, schedule. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about getting that for Saturday, uh, Saturday or Sunday, because if I can do it Sunday, then um, I'll get the uh, tickets for that myself. That was, uh, I got to looking at it and I realized, you know, all the air shows we went to, uh, well, there at DM and uh, Ben had a had a Navy uh, Master Chief photographer that was at I think he was at North Island, mm -hmm. and he knew some somebody somewhere everywhere. So we were always getting in early at air shows or getting on the top of hangars. And it's like getting in early to walk the line and photograph the aircraft and getting an ideal spot to, to view the air show was never a problem. And yeah, I'm absolutely. sitting here thinking of coming to DM. Yep. <laughs> I don't have that in anymore. I'm going to have to make my own decision. <laughs> I will say talking about uh, air shows, our uh, Air National Guard Squadron did two air shows here in Brunswick. Uh, and we were, you know, it's one of those things if, if uh, questions are free, uh, the guys that were putting it together asked and we got to get, get the first F-117 to an air show, mm. which everybody was just like, how did you, you podunk guys do that? Well, we asked. You never know. <laughs> you never know unless you ask. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My now were those air shows at Moody or Warner Robins? It was here in Brunswick. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. This uh, I, Brunswick uh, at one time was NAS Glencoe mm -hmm. in World War II, which was a Navy blimp base. So yeah. It's one of the longer runways on the East Coast. Yeah, Brun I think Brunswick has got um, one of the last. Um, Dirigible hangars, I think, uh, other than Lakenhurst. Uh, yeah, they they finally it. took it down. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Wow. That's sad. That is sad. That's history right there. I think the USS Macon was stationed over there, if I'm not mistaken. So, gentlemen, last question here. A couple here. of the old chiefs that were, were there when they closed the base and some right. wild stories about what they, what is supposedly buried out there. You know, and, and well, when I, used to, when I used to work at, uh, at um, Ascent Aviation up there in, in Marana, I would hear all kinds of rumors about things that were actually stored uh, in, in, in the ground. Um, we, there was an underground tunnel when the CIA was out there that they would pass, uh, they did the Ayatollah, they flew him to Marana. And then they switched them off to another plane and, uh, and, and have them go back to the Middle East. And that was weird. I'm like, I, how did they do that without people seeing it? <laughs> and uh, also, I, from what I understand, there's some uh, B-17s that are, are buried out there. And uh, nobody will tell me the truth. <laughs> well, uh, a lot of our guys at the gun club are retired federal law enforcement firearms mm -hmm. guys. And they were building, upgrading a one of their ranges and drilling, putting pylons down. And uh, said, nope, we got to stop and move this because they were chunking up radial engine parts. Oh my goodness. So it's like, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that up, move on. <laughs> 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 Moving right along. All right, guys. So the last two question I have for, for uh, both of you. Now I know, I know Dell's got a concise, going to have a concise answer for this one, but uh John, I really I would like your feedback on it as well, if you could. Um, now, I, I asked this question to uh, Colonel Alex Wright, who's the executive director of the 390th, and I'm sure you saw that, that interview. Um, um, what advice would you give young people um, who want to get a career in aviation, Dell? That's going to be posed for you first. Uh, first of all, that's a great question. It's a great question from the perspective of a lot of people don't think about what they want to do until they're literally within a day or two or a week of having to make the decision, right? It's, it's you're, you're at decision time. Do I go to college or do I join the military? That kind of a thing. Um, my advice to someone, who, to someone who's 14, 15, 16 is to, first of all, learn everything you can on your own. There's so much information out there now compared to when, of course, we were kids 30, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, no longer do you have to go to a book or go to a library and hope there's a book on the subject you want. You can get any, all the information you want. So first of all, educate yourself. 
Second of all, as you transition into your final couple of years in high school, find a company in aviation and see if they've got an internship program. And what they will do is they will offer you a job through the summer. Uh, it sometimes is even paid, uh, but at the, at the high school level, probably not. But in the, once you transition into college, if you wanna you once again do an internship, they oftentimes pay you. Uh, and the reason this is important is because if you get an internship as a senior in high school and perhaps a year or two in college, you've now got multiple lines on your resume that says Pratt and Whitney, General Electric, Boeing, wherever you happen to have gone, and you've got no kidding real experience. And you are so far ahead of your contemporaries who didn't take this approach uh, that, the, that the difference is just night and day. Plus, it's just good for you to figure out what kind of an environment you want to be in. Do you want to be in airframing? Do you want to be in propulsion? Do you want to be in maintenance or management? Go find out. Don't make the decision blind. Mm. I thought very, um, very good. I say I never had me personally. I never had that uh, advice when I was when I was growing up. So I went into electronics. I said, hey, I went into electronics. Then I went into computers. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's what happened. That's my that's my my advice from my own personal from my, from my father. And he says, hey, you can put your money on. You can do anything you put your mind to, you know, and that's very true. Very true. Yep. If, yep. John, did you want to chime in on that one? Uh, that was fantastic advice. Uh, the, the hard lesson I learned was liking something and being enthusiastic about it isn't the same as getting a good education in it. Uh, mm. Yep. <laughs> that was my mistake. You know, loving airplanes and uh, didn't, and I made the mistake when I went in the Air Force. Uh, this was back in 62. And I let the recruiter say, uh, you know, hey, I want to go out, you know, I want to work on airplanes. Okay, no sweat. Off you go. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I wound up stacking BBs for four years. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ask questions are free. Ask, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, if somebody doesn't want there's you to ask a question, go find somebody else to talk to. That was there, the other yeah, thing I made as a young person. There's so much information out there now, especially now we got the internet. I grew, we all grew up where we used to have to read books all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course there's no, no books on some of the subjects that are out there today where we, you know, it's like, I, I just got this one book. Uh, it's called the uh, We Seven. It's about the seven Mercury astronauts. I never knew that book existed until now, until uh, going to Space Fest because there's a few people that mentioned it. I'm like, wait a minute, there's a book out there about that was written by them. I didn't know that until until I was told. I was like, okay. So yeah, Dell and, and John are are correct, guys. You know, it education it, be persistent on what you want to do. It's for the little children out there too, because they are in their prior in their infancy of learning about what life really is. And once they get to like maybe 13 to 17, that's when they start saying, Oh, well, I I want to be like that guy, you know. I mean, they nowadays they've got Axl Rose and they've got uh, Madonna and they got all that as, as idols. I mean, you guys are are the idols because you guys work in the aviation industry, you know. If, if yeah, if somebody find you know if you like working with your hands, mm -hmm. then you know. Unfortunately, I'm the I'm the classic thing of the military. You know, I had a like a 98 mechanical, 92 electrical, and an 80 something admin ASFAB score. I wound up my whole career doing, doing administrative stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, classic for the government. Yeah, very <laughs> yeah, true. We've always <laughs> going to test results and put you where they want you. Right. Yeah, go home, go find something I could work on, you know, <laughs> and build something. Uh, you know, don't, don't get diverted and, and uh, well, you know, look see, at a whole bunch of different things, like Dell said, you know, find out if you like. You know, uh, airframe mm -hmm. or electronics, or absolutely, or yep. there's, uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's nothing more powerful than actual, just factual knowledge, and then pair that up with experience and perspective, and no one's going to stop you. Yeah. That's right. See, uh, my my uncle, um, my my father's uncle or my father's brother, actually was an inventor. That's where I get my tinkering from. 
you know, I get my tinkering uh, bug from because I like to tinker with things. Uh, and it's like, oh, where'd this screw, screw come from? Oh, man, I forgot to put it back in there. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, all right, guys, uh, that's it for right now, I guess. And uh, I want to thank both of you for uh, coming on. Del, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Uh, and it was an honor talking to both of you. Um, and I appreciate uh, this is going to go up on our YouTube channel so everybody can I see. Throw one, one more thing in, if I may, Dan. Go for it. Um, I was talking about, you know, Ben uh, getting me into to doing good photography and so forth. Uh, Dale paid me one of the best compliments I've ever had when he, when he got my, started getting my, my slides and photographed. He used the word artist, and I was like, oh, my God. I got something right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. My pleasure. That was a great, great compliment. Hey, that was that was awesome. That's awesome. That guys. stuck in my head. That's awesome. See, that, see, and you guys are. I think you guys are considering me an artist because of what I'm doing with the, you know, keeping the fans entertained about, you know, with all the diff these different interviews and uh, all the walkarounds. I mean. I think I think we are the only uh, YouTube channel that's got walkarounds exclusively of aircraft, and I came up with a, me and my, my friend Mark. We both came up with the idea: why not touch these aircraft in the videos? That way, they can say, "Oh, it's you can actually see it and feel it," you know. And, and we don't talk in the videos. That's that's one thing we don't do, you know. So, and that's we get the people to feel of what it sounds like to touch them, to bang them, and, you know, to, to look at all the stuff, you know. But, um, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much. It was an honor for, for you both to be on today. Thank you. All right. Great to meet you, Dale. Thank Take you. Take care, sir. All right, stand by, guys. <laughs>